Hello everyone, my name is Kevin Boyle. Uh, I am here to read some of my poems to you and talk about poetry. And before I begin, I just want to say thank you to Western Carolina for organizing this special coronavirus appearance. And uh, I'm going to start with a poem uh, that has something to do with being in college, because I know most of you are probably in college. This poem is about my experience working in a supermarket. I worked there for five years, all the time I was in college and even after I graduated. So uh, I will read it and then maybe say a word or two about it. And it is called University Dreams. I tell my daughter I only spent one Friday night on campus when I was in college and she seems so saddened by my loss, I love her even more. At 16, she hates school and is eager to go where she imagines every Friday night will be filled with ecstasy. Not the drug, just the feeling. And Saturday night as well, perhaps Sunday. She doesn't mention Monday through Thursday much. When I tell her I lived at home and took the bus and L that left me off, six blocks from my first class on astronomy, taught by a man whose accent was from another galaxy. She asks about Friday nights, Saturday, and I tell her everything about the supermarket, how there were cash registers to punch and no scanners, and they hadn't invented the blood absorber, so all the meats bled as if freshly slaughtered, and how once, during the five years, the retail clerks international went out on strike, which meant I could be on campus on a Friday night, even Saturday morning, before I had to return to pick it. And did you make up for lost time, she asked. It was so long ago I can't remember everything, except that feeling of being alone and walking alone, along fraternity row, all the parties in full bloom, each house surrounded by a moat of people smoking and drinking, and then meeting somehow, a girl from astronomy coming back from the library, Jewish, both parents doctors, from Westchester. I told her my mother was from the Bronx, and somehow she invited me in for a drink, and then such a dark horse to stay the night. At that time I believed in half-hearted class warfare, and so felt oppositional, and I was terrified of her, her openness, her license, her black hair, and by Tuesday, we had won concessions. The strike was over, and I was back standing up in my apron, blood here and there, kind of comforted by the inhibitions, the tamping down, knowing that soon would come the ecstasy, and I wasn't far from wrong. So where do poems come from? For, in this particular poem, it just comes from my own experience working on a ca in a supermarket at the cash register. And I guess the impetus for the poem would be uh, something that was slightly odd, which was that I had never been on my college campus on a weekend, Friday or Saturday, because I work Friday, Saturday, and Sunday usually. So that was an odd thing, that if you go to college but you're not ever there for a Friday night, seems like a pity. Uh, so the only time I was able to go to campus on a Friday night was when my union was out on strike. So a poem might derive from some experience that's slightly unusual. So if I had never, if I had always gone to uh, campus every Friday and Saturday night, I pro probably wouldn't be able to write a poem about that. But the fact that this was slightly odd, I was unlike most people in college, because most people were enjoying themselves on Friday night. I enjoyed myself too, just I was making money. Okay, <clears throat> how about where do poems come from? I have another one that's just based on a, an experience that I had. I was traveling in Ireland and uh, this, uh, ex the, this, what happens in this poem, the little narrative, it's a tiny little poem. What happens in the poem actually happened and so that's a, kind of like a nice moment for writers. 
you feel like you all you have to do is write down what happened and maybe it'll work out. Okay, this is called the Word of God. People might say I'm lying when I say a boy, maybe 10 or 12, asked me in Ireland if people died in America as well because their brother died that winter. He was only eight, and maybe three or four of them waited by the river, stones in hand for skipping, all looking up at me and waiting, those beautifully full Irish clouds passing. So if someone ever asks you if people die in your country, uh, it should feel odd enough or unusual enough for you to say, hmm, I think I'll keep that in my back pocket and maybe write something about it someday. Uh, the, I also have poems that do not derive from personal experience, working in supermarkets or traveling to Ireland. Sometimes I'll just make things up. For example, uh, I have a poem that you can probably tell is not based on fact because uh, the poem ha uh, involves reading to my dog and having my dog respond to me. So those of you with knowledge about dogs will probably say to yourselves, well, that doesn't seem likely. It doesn't seem possible that a dog would speak to a person. And that is true. In this poem, I'm just imagining what that might be like. So this is called um, Reading the Bible with my lap dog on my lap. At any sound, the children moving upstairs, the fridge rumbling to a stop, the cat next door licking its paws, my dog would almost foam at the mouth, yelling about injustice, infringement, the terrors of night. But when I read the Bible silently, how quiet she became on my lap, warming my little dancing heart, asking finally how she was portrayed there in Holy Writ. In Holy Writ, it is written, I began, that you return to your own vomit, darling. You lounge with sorcerers and those who practice falsehoods. You have a mighty appetite and lick even the sores of lepers, and you should not be given that which is holy, nor, likewise, should swine get tossed pearls. She agreed with the latter, hating pigs who, once cleaned, returned to their mire to wallow, but the rest made her feel unloved, excluded, like a cane among animals, a pariah with a glossy coat. I said, be not afeard. I only read this for sport. I am not a thumper of Bibles. I believe that when you die and I bury you among the hollies that abut our land, you will be in a maggoty paradise of unknowing, your appetite contained, your desire for balls being thrown silenced, and when I join you, we will be brought together in a feast of emptiness. All of my commands now questions, the soil will answer. Oh, master, she said, that is not paradise, but eternal gloom, my bark equal to my bite, but zero in the tally. My happy tale, unwaggable. And I, so be it, for it is so ordained. Let us cry together now. And so we did, her eyes glistening, fly free, lambent, and she licked the sores of my open face, imagining what we would become. Easy, girl, I said, easy. I guess it's maybe too obvious to say, but where does that one come from? Yes, it comes from the imagination, but also I do have a dog, and I have a very, or I had a very strong religious upbringing. Um, so that comes into play. Probably, um, I could say that another poem that maybe is influenced not just by what happens in life, but also what I read will be a poem that's about my, uh, was about my daughter when she was younger, and it is a poem that makes reference to a lot of poems by Walt Whitman. So in the poem there's little references to Whitman, but if you don't get the references it doesn't really matter. 
Uh, the poem is about uh, my daughter eating animal crackers, which I hope all of you did when you were younger. They are just cute, about this size, and you can chew them down fast. Enjoy a sweet snack. Um, uh, this one's a little bit longer than the others I've read, so maybe go get a drink now or something. <clears throat> okay, this is uh, They Do Her Bidding. I wish I could turn and live with the animal crackers the way my daughter can, speaking with the giraffes as if they were kin, and letting the giraffes have their say too. No hog, she gives the floor to others before severing their legs. Although the lion seems placid, she roars it into high dudgeon until it attacks a table leg and is defeated. She has enjoyed a Bible story tape, so she knows to call the animals to her hand that's a double for the ark and to bring them safely to the shore of the rug off the high seas of the wood floor. And perhaps Noah did as she does, but it went unrecorded. She eats some of what she saved from the flood, parts, not the whole. Then she plays in history, selects three to behead, eats head, and forces the torsos to confess, to admit. She does not whine about her decision, but allows her left hand to know what her right is doing, as she brings Hippo and Zebra together to kiss and mount, at least from my angle. And then she spins the lion atop the bear, the menagerie gone debauched, and then into despair, a post-coital sleep she rouses them from, to be eaten. Wake up, she whispers, and meet my loose tooth. Suddenly my shoulder is the great mountain lion, the lion has climbed to receive revelations, and her lap is where the animals fly, though some walk, to have their wounds dressed. When I hear her say in animal voice, eat me, I know her crackers have become sacrificial lambs, and she a communicant. My daughter is a slaughterhouse, a rendering plant, a tannery, as she skins them with her little nibbles. And this girl, who has never tried meat or fish, neither surf nor turf fit for her palate, runs rampant all over the flesh of these beasts she's loved and now lost. I want to say, everything will be like this, sweetheart. Everything lost will be inside you in some way. I want to teach her pity and mercy, but she places a silent bear in my mouth's range, and I put the roof of my mouth over its head. She takes her hammer from her doctor's kit and knocks at the zebra's leg until the reflex is simply to drop off. She introduces her multicolored zebra doll to the tan one, and they converse across the color line. Small talk about who will do the other's bidding, who will be saddled and rode. She has no fondness for animals in the flesh, neither dogs, nor cats, nor horses, nor mice, but these she adores, wants to help them with their blood loss, or affix the toy blood pressure cuff to their heads, and now she's teaching them to sing, and they follow her lead, first the high-flying flag song, then America the Beautiful, becoming quiet only as they pass her lips and enter her in bliss. I do have another poem about eating, or sort of about food, so that seems like an appropriate one to read right now. This is... Um, a poem about clementines, which used to just come from Spain, but I think they come from the U.S. now. But a lot of times you get them in a wooden crate, usually January or February, I think December, January, something like that. They come in a wooden crate, and you get like 30 of them at a time. So this is another poem that's based, you know, slightly on life. Clementines do exist. They do come in a wooden crate. But then I'm also imagining certain things I do with my wife. I know that sounds ridiculous, but <clears throat> you'll see that the poem is ridiculous. It's about playing with clementines. 
darling clementines. We'd often buy the clementines in late winter to remember having children. Not that our own children would ever eat the clementines, preferring gum and sugar cubes, but the tiny clementines made us feel like parents again. Oh, how we'd watch over them in their little manger of Spanish wood, little Moses boats that arrived in our home, the bitumen and pitch worn off, and we'd hold them to our ear to hear the sound of the land. I would touch or touch their little belly buttons and think of the mother alone in her planned garden. We'd use our fingernails to clean off the thin layers of wax, the appropriate herbicide and shellac, then teach them to say prayers. Just rote learning, we knew, but still there was hope. Though our own children preferred television to God, we thought perhaps, and then maybe, and placed them on their knees, our fingers offering support so they didn't tip. We'd sit with our legs spread on the kitchen floor. How long had it been since we sat on the kitchen floor? And we'd roll the little darlings to our seats of knowledge, back and forth, tiring them out before the long afternoon nap. Then we'd choose one to love more than the others and bring it to lie beside us in bed. Even when we made love in the old-timey way, we'd let it lie there and watch with its single eye. This is love, would say afterwards, and it would just play possum, feigning lack of interest, lack of concern for our hearts. We both heard a voice telling us to sacrifice one orphan with a paring knife, and I gladly bound it to the cutting board, the one clementine we never adored, and slew it, hunting for seeds, getting all manly with the task. You turned your back. Then we'd tire of the lot before long, annoyed at how quickly they aged, their skin depressing, fallen, even their wood crate seeming to rot. And we took them in a ceremony to the compost heap, you working the thurible, its beautiful, clinking, rhythmic sound, surrounded by black smoke, and I placed them gently on their massive, darkling pillow of mulch to be, announcing, you are our hope, our future, and then would take the long way home, afraid of ourselves, looking away from everything living, as if that were even possible, somewhat ashamed, really, if truth be told. Maybe a, a poem that has something to do with traveling, since none of us can travel anymore. Maybe it's good to read a poem about traveling and trying to remember what that used to be like. Not only to leave your house and leave your block, but actually fly in a plane. And I was lucky enough to fly to Italy. Uh, because of my job, and I have a poem about being in Rome. <clears throat> There's a couple strange words in here, but uh, the Apennines, or the mountain chain that runs down the center of Italy, Carabinieri, or the police in Italy, and in here I imagine the Roman numeral 10, which is, as you know, like shaped like an X. <clears throat> Okay, this one is called um, uh, fitting in. I also notice there's a Latin phrase, uh, no me tangere, which just means don't touch me. Fitting in. All weekend long in Rome, I tried so hard to do what the Romans were doing, but never knew who was Roman, who from the provinces, who a naturalized citizen, who just part of a foreign throng. And so I emulated the men in marble on horseback or seated on thrones, wore victory in my hair, and looked imperious while I waited for gelato to arrive from the Apennines, it seemed to take that long, and brushed off beggars who chose me as an easy mark. No limitandre, I counseled during my rebuff. Then I decided to ape the goddesses in fountains and stone nymphs for a diversion. I removed my sandals and hat, feeling like a Roman myth, if not a Roman, 
and look both seductive and hairy, my arms often extended in a welcoming way, or to ward off suitors, depending on the moment, and I made my way down through the centuries to the forum, where I found Roman numerals I could become, became a ten for the longest time, arms and legs stretched and pointing to the sky, the earth, until the carabinieri took me away finally, when I became the she-wolf, who nursed both Romulus and Remus, down on all fours, my face kind of anxious and calm, as nursing mothers often seem, my shirt long ago tossed into a massive ditch, letting those great boys tug at the little I had to offer. Maybe I should have also said that Romulus and Remus, as you probably know, are the legendary founders of Rome, and they got their start by having a she-wolf take care of them and letting the she-wolf nurse them in their first few months. Okay, maybe I could end with a newer poem. Um, you figure that if the coronavirus is happening everywhere and it's in the news and yes, what else would people write about? Well, I don't seem to write about anything that actually is happening in the news, uh, so I do not have a corona poem. Uh, I just have a short poem that maybe once again, uh, um, I started this with a poem about education since you're all students, and maybe this is mildly interesting because it's about a person from the 13th century, 13th century in Sicily, who uh, was very curious and interested in how things worked. And, okay, this is called The Head. Founder of the world's oldest public university, Frederick II loved to wonder, asking if a falcon could hunt without sight, just by smell alone, and so he bound the eyes. Would a soul escape through a bunghole? And so he starved a prisoner inside a dry cask, the final moments watched as if watching for meteors. Who would digest a meal better, one who went on a long hunt after the meal, or one who was put to dead, put to bed, the two both disemboweled to learn. And what language would a child speak, who never was spoken to? Would it be the language of Eden, Hebrew, Greek perhaps, or the language of the parents, who, though forced to be silent, passed on their tongue? Ah, the sharp minds desire to know it all. And that brings to an end our brief reading. Once again, I'm Kevin Boyle. I grew up in Philadelphia. I teach currently at Elon University, and I'm very happy to join you today in Western Car at Western Carolina. I hope you have a good pretty good online experience, the remaining days of it, and I hope you're doing well. Thank you, and good luck.